Today is September 15th, 2010. We're in New York City at Teachers College for the Teachers College Oral History Project. My name is Jessica Wiederhorn, and today I'm speaking with Professor Lampros Kamitas. Hello. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thanks. Um, well, um, as I mentioned, um, before we really get down to the nitty gritty of talking about Teachers College and your time here, um, please just tell me something about yourself and um, the, your background and the path you took that led you to Teachers College. Well, I'm one of the very few native New Yorkers at Teachers College. I've lived within a mile and a half of the college all my life, except when I work outside of the country, and I've been here a long time. I am also perhaps the only person on the, on the teacher's college faculty that is completely Columbia. That is, I went to Columbia College. I am a product of the, the graduate faculties of Columbia. My first job was teaching at Columbia and the graduate faculties, and my only other job was at teacher's college, 100 yards away. Um, actually, my career at Columbia, which goes back to, unfortunately, well, I'm, it is fortunate I'm still alive, uh, goes back to 1943. I, I entered Columbia College in 43, and the first thing they had us do before they accepted us was to take uh, the Stanford Binet uh, examination, which was given in 408 Main Hall in this building. Uh, and that was my first experience at Columbia, actually, was at Teachers College. Then I didn't see it again for about 25 years, but <laughs> it's, uh, I came back to it later. Even though you were across the street. <laughs> actually, I was across the street, and uh, what had happened to get here was that uh, oh, I'm sorry. the current, uh, the, the, the chairman of, a, of an extremely prestigious department at that time uh, asked, uh, was trying to fill in slots in the disciplines and he apparently asked the Department of Anthropology, which I was then teaching in across the street, if they had somebody to spare or to give away or to, to throw out or something. And uh, I was asked to join the faculty at Teachers College. So I, I came 100 yards over at that time. So. But, be, but before we go there, um, uh, how did you choose your major as an undergraduate? Ah, everything to me in my life is serendipitous. It uh, happens. It looks as if it's by chance, and I hope it wasn't. But, uh, Columbia College <coughs> in those days, uh, which has the great core curriculum, uh, had no major system. So that you, you, there was a system of maturity credits, things you had to take. But you could, you could do whatever you wanted. So I ended up doing basically history and government. It was I called public law and government. And uh, uh, so if somebody asked me what I did as an undergraduate, it's a little difficult. Actually, it was, it was all spread out. Uh, I did not, my, my field is anthropology, but I did no anthropology at that time at all, though I had a number of colleagues uh, in my class who became anthropologists in the Department of Anthropology who were teaching there when I arrived as a graduate student, <laughs> which I, I had done a number of things before that. Uh, what had happened was I was drafted into the Army just before I graduated from Columbia College, on my 18th birthday, actually. And this was toward the tail, well, it was, the war was over, but uh, technically it was not. They were still drafting people. And I came back in 1947, finished Columbia College, and then I had the GI Bill of Rights since I was now a great veteran, uh, you know, the youngest and the least <laughs> veteranized veteran there ever was. And I went to, um, the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. I thought I would become a, a great ambassador or something. Uh, and uh, I left in a half because I missed, I missed New York and Columbia, came back to Columbia, and did political science before I entered anthropology. It's a rather cir circuitous mm -hmm. little track. Um, and so what was it about anthropology that finally attracted you? Um, anthropology is an interesting field. It's um, more interesting now, perhaps, than I knew then. but. Uh, uh, it was very interesting. I had I had gotten I was married. I had gotten married, being a nice Greek boy and married a nice Greek girl, and there are all these cultural obligations, of course, that you should be hardworking, you know, earn a living, and so on. So uh, when I got out, when I finished Columbia, the the political science, uh, I went to work in a steamship company, of course, 
where a Greek is supposed to go, except this was not, an, not a Greek shipping company, it was an American one. And uh, I'd won, I'd taken an examination for a, a scholarship, a war veteran scholarship, and won it, and I, it was just a matter of you know, a, few, a few points and dollars, I don't remember exactly. So I'd asked my boss if I could not, if I, uh, uh, how did he, if, if, if I didn't have to work overtime when the ships came in, and he said, of course you have to work all the time. And I said, that's not very nice. I quit. And then I said, what do I do now? I'll go back to school. This is the refuge of all time. And I remember having a great discussion with a very close friend of mine. Uh, who, and the, the, the third friend was, by this time, an assistant professor of anthropology. So I said, if X. Who, who was that? Do I have to, well, the, the story doesn't end this way. He, well, actually, it was Marvin Harris, who was a very, and he, he died recently, he has just died about a year ago. Uh, it was very close. So they, uh, it was very funny that my, the other friend said, uh, listen, with your background, you're too short and greasy to become an ambassador. <laughs> Ridiculous. And you're too blind to be a historian. <laughs> so how about anthropology? <laughs> it sort of fits in the middle. And if Marvin can do it, for God's sake, you should be able to. <laughs> but it wasn't quite so simple. Actually, uh, the anthropology, social and cultural anthropology, fit, fitted in very well with many of my, my interests, uh, uh, intellectual interests, academic interests. So it was a very easy fit into the, into the place. And um, when you, well, what did you do your uh, dissertation on and your field work? Uh, well, I was, uh, the way anthropology works, you, do dis you go away for a year or two and come back with great knowledge, which you try to impress your, your mentors with. Uh, quite by, I was, um, I had been, this is part of the story, uh, I was, there was a, a research institute that had been set up at Columbia in the Department of Anthropology by an alumna, quite well-known woman later on, named Vera Rubin, and uh, she was setting up a, a seminar for people to work in the tropics. We weren't quite sure where the tropics were at that time. Uh, so the Caribbean was selected, being non-tropical, to be the tropics. And uh, a group of us were sent down to two places, Martinique and Barbados. I got to, I was told to go to Barbados, which I, uh, I did. And uh, had, uh, the supervision was done by a professor named Manners who was a professor then at Brandeis University uh, and a Columbia uh, graduate. Anyway, uh, he apparently gave me a good report or something so that people began to smile upon me in, in the department. Uh, I then applied for a grant to go to Greece, given my great facility with the Greek language and the knowledge of Greek custom and all these other nice things, and uh, which, I, which I got, supposedly, I was told, by the uh, Social Science Research Council that I or well, the president then that I'd gotten it. But I received a letter saying I got nothing at the end. And my, my professor told me that he told him not to give it to me because somebody else needed a grant and I could always go somewhere. And I went back to the Caribbean for that on the full ride. But I, much of my work um, at that point was in two places, Barbados and Jamaica. And it was an assignment, actually. I, these were the early Fulbright grants, which were given to institutions abroad to bring in somebody to do something that they wanted. So I was to look at, uh, uh, for, of all things, at cooperatives among fishermen. And fishermen in the Caribbean are a very strange lot. They, they don't look like any other kind of fishermen. They, they, it's technologically really quite low level. But it became a very interesting issue and very problems. And I wrote my dissertation on that. Um, and it was an area that anthropologists at that time were not looking at. We were, anthropology was going off to the great traditional not primitive, but pre-literate places of the world, Africa, you know, the interior of South America, this sort other. Of the Caribbean was this you know, curious little place. It wasn't yet a tourist area, but still, you know, who knew what the Caribbean was? But it was actually very good. And I became really quite a, an authority on Caribbean over time, so. Okay, well, I've, I've read the list of your publications, so I think that's a modest way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, and, and, and you taught, you were hired to teach at, at Columbia? To, uh, well, that's the, in, the most interesting part of it, at least in terms of, uh, again, serendipity. I arrived back from Jamaica, I remember, September of uh, 1958. In those days, 
American universities were very civilized. They began the semester at the end of September, the, the academic year. I mean, it's horrible now what they do. It's terrible. <laughs> anyway, September is a glorious month not to be at the university. <laughs> anyway, uh, I arrived with a friend of mine who was, a, even back then, an eminent anthropologist from Jamaica, a Jamaican, uh, a man named M.G. Smith, a renowned anthropologist. He died a number of years ago. But, and uh, he had never seen Columbia, and I were wandering through the hallway. I was a graduate student. He was a well-known anthropologist in Jamaica. And he was on his way to become a, prof a full professor at UCLA. He was just traveling through the... So the door opens at Skirmahan, where the anthropology department is across the street. And uh, the chairman comes out, a man named Conrad Ahrensberg, a very sweet, lovely, uh, again, a very good anthropologist, who I, I didn't think uh, knew me from Adam. Uh, I'd been away a year and a half at this point, and he, he sort of pokes his finger out and said, uh, come on in, and he offered me a job. And uh, as I tell the story, I thought he was going to offer me a job sweeping the streets. What else? Or the floor. So it turned out, I, I, my guess is that they, they had lost some junior instructor at the last minute, and they needed to fill up. So I started teaching three courses a, a semester uh, a week later. So I'd come back from the field. By that time, of course, I had forgotten all my anthropology, so it was a little bit of a, a, little bit of a strain. But it was uh, the story that uh, goes with that, which is very nice, is that uh, I, I guess I am a little bit of a contrarian because I don't do things the way they should be done by whatever group I belong to. So Greeks are notoriously late for everything, or at least it is so said. I always seem to get there early. So uh, I ended up in my first class getting there early, and it was to teach contemporary civilization, which was this glorious course that uh, taught at Columbia College, uh, and I had taken with Jacques Barzun, the great eminent historian of all time. And, uh, uh, and, I, and, and of course, when I was taking it, I was undoubtedly falling asleep because I couldn't remember <laughs> all that went on in it. And I sat there. With, I walked into the classroom, and there was a young man, a student. And in those days, I didn't look quite as old as I look now. This was, what, 50 years ago, more than that. Uh, and he, we discussed what idiot graduate student was going to come in to teach the course. So we talked about it and talked about it, and I agreed, this is horrible, the system, I wonder what it was going to be. And then the whole class assembled, and we all talked about it, and the bell rang, and we all talked about it, and then they decided, should they wait 15 minutes for, for you know, the usual routine? And the bell rang again, I got up, and that was the beginning and the end of my teaching career. <laughs> so, anyway, that's how I... Uh, so, so, so it was a little bit of a, I won't say an accident, but uh, I was quite fortunate if in, in the sense that I ended up with my first job being essentially my permanent job. Uh, I, it was at a clearly important university in the Department of Anthropology that was the first to be created in the United States. So it was. And what uh, year was that? Uh, 1958 when I started teaching there. And, um, uh, so, ha did you have any knowledge, really, of what was happening at Teachers College at that time? Uh, I had one bit, but not um, when I had gotten out of the college in 1948, and before I went off to Georgetown to the School of Foreign Service, I got a job with uh, a man that I, uh, years later, became a very close colleague to, uh, a man named uh, R. Freeman Butts who was uh, then a professor of history here, history and education, who became quite famous for his work in, in, in international studies organization, but was then running a project on the citizenship education, a citizenship education project. And I worked for a year for him at, at some remarkable amount of money, a dollar and a half a day, an hour or something, whatever it was in those days. And uh, but then left and went back into the other side, but that was, but uh, so I, literally my first really long-term and, and permanent involvement came uh, in 1964. I was then an assistant professor of anthropology at Columbia, and uh, the uh, the teachers' college had just well within a couple a couple of years before just organized its divisional structure, and uh, there were. 
to be five divisions, one in psychology, one in uh, nursing, one in instruction, one in educational options or something, and uh, one in called philosophy and the social science. And the one who, the person who directed the so philosophy and the social science was the famous Lawrence Kremen, uh, who uh, a few years later became president of Teachers College. So he had, uh, uh, years later, talking about it, we were very good friends uh, afterwards. Uh, he had asked for, he was building up the, the division and it, it was going to represent the six major disciplines outside of psychology that did any work in education and would provide service courses to the college. So it was anthropology, sociology, economics, politics, philosophy, and history. Uh, and I think he was trying to build up the anthropology had gone across the street and asked for some recommendations and uh, uh, ended up with me. It was very funny. I kept saying, I, I don't know anything about education. How about fishing? Can I tell you something? <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, the Kremen had a very broad uh, understanding of education. Uh, he uh, uh, clearly wanted to expand the, uh, uh, the use of the social sciences in education, certainly at Teachers College, and was a very, vi even, even as a young chairman, he was probably the most important faculty member going back then in 19. 64. Um, and so, uh, had you thought about anthropology and education at all until then? Um, what I had thought about uh, was um, really the application of anthropology. Now, what I had done as, as a, a field research for dissertation was something that was asked for by Supposedly, the Jamaican colonial government had a problem with their fishing population. Uh, the, the, the British government was about to withdraw from the colonies. They wanted to leave good things behind, and they had started several research institutes to do these kinds of things. So in my case, they'd asked for, let's see how fishermen cooperate. Can we pull them together? Can we do something? And it was an applied project. Not that my colleagues at Columbia laughed at that time, but it was very interesting. The ideology then was that uh, applied anthropology was something that people not very well trained in anthropology did and put it around. And, and in, in any case, there were, there were ethical questions about social engineering, pushing people to do things and so on. Uh, actually, uh, I'm, I used to argue then, this is ridiculous, you're all applied. I mean, even though if you, t if you do nothing but teach in Columbia College, which at that time, and probably still now, uh, sends every graduate to, to, to a graduate school or to a medical school or to a law school, everybody. I mean, there's nobody that's left behind in that thing. And, the, the, and they take anthropology as a kind of a gut course to get an A to build up their, to build up their resumes. I said, even that is really trying to, um, the, 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 the person teaching anthropology is, is essentially teaching a, a, a worldview, a perspective, a global, holistic, comparative framework. And if that's not applied, then very, very few things are applied. In any case, uh, when I came over here, I saw, the, I saw uh, this is nothing more than an application of anthropology. And the way you, let's say you make good people, you make anthropologists, uh, do good work in education or in the application of anthropology to education is to make them into good anthropologists and p put them in a setting that uh, this can happen. And this was really quite uh, what happened at uh, Teachers College. Teachers College is a professional school. Uh, it deals with uh, uh, the training of teachers, people in education, people who can deal with education and so on down the line. Um, anthropology, uh, the social sciences, that can provide certain kinds of service to this kind of group. But the atmosphere is very interesting. It is practical. It's nothing but applied. That's, so therefore, they're quite wel they quite welcome the application of whatever it might be, or the toolkit that comes from a particular discipline to, to anthropology. But so do you have, I, I, so, you, so you are telling me that you were the first anthropologist uh, uh, no. in this department, in this new division? No, uh, there was one, eminent senior 
anthropologist, Solon Kimball, uh, who, was, who had been here for about 15 years, but left, not because of me, I hope, uh, the year after I came here. Uh, in fact, well, I know he did. And he, went, he became a university professor at the, uh, at the University of Florida. And then at, at that point, asked me to come down to be the chair of that department. I kept saying, that's a very nice thing to do, to teach his college at this one. Anyway, uh, no, he was here. And there's always been, a, uh, I won't say a history of uh, systematic training of anthropology at these college, but there's always been a kind of anthropological presence. There have been some very eminent social scientists at Teachers College in the past, and Lyman Bryce and George, people, George Counts, activists, social activists who kind of used anthropological perspectives. And then, in fact, uh, there was collaboration of individual anthropologists from either across the street or from other parts of uh, New York, that is, other institutions in New York, uh, with Teachers College people in areas like uh, culture and personality or what we now call psychological anthropology. Margaret Mead was one of these. Margaret Mead was very popular at Teachers College. Uh, she's thought to be, of course, always thought to be a professor at Columbia. She was always an adjunct, uh, though she has more importance than anybody else in anthropology at Columbia, uh, but came and loved Teachers College. In fact, if, uh, one of the, going back to my coming here, I, uh, she had been a teacher of mine and then also a colleague for a number of years at uh, Columbia. And I, I told her that I'd been offered this job at Teachers College and I asked her what, what she thought of it. And she said, uh, you know, she, she, didn't, she didn't ponder very long. She said, you know, if I were your age and, this was, uh, and I was offered a job at Columbia or Teachers College, I'd go to Teachers College. I said, you'd not go to Columbia. He says, no, 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 Teachers College is much better for you, for me, for you. I said, why? He says, because you can really missionize anthropology at Teachers College. You can do it in the Department of Anthropology. And she was, I mean, if you know anything about her history, and she's on the, the Johnny Carson or the Johnny Parr, I forget what these characters show and get on, and she would talk about, you know, all these relationships, cultural relationships and so on, her work in New Guinea and Samoa, and how it related to American education, drug use, you name it, she covered it. But she, was, she, was, she really liked the, the setting of Teachers College very much. So all I'm saying is that uh, there was, and in fact, Kremen himself, uh, who was trained as a historian, he has a Columbia degree, but he was trained at Teachers College, uh, did a lot of work in the anthropology department. He told me that much later, and I kept saying, well, how come you never mentioned it? And I, I kept saying, why did you do it? My guess was that, uh, you thought the pretty, that the Teachers College anthropology ladies were prettier than the ones in Hitler. Mm -hmm. I, I won't go there. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and I, I have in my notes that, uh, that in, 19, in the 1960s, um, Margaret Mead was one of the people who formed the Council on Anthropology and Education. And uh, yeah, probably. At, within the American Anthropological Association. Yeah. Um, and that still exists. Yeah. Um, so, uh, were, were you part of this Council on Anthropology? And I've education? always been a member, but I, I, was, never, I was never particularly a, you know, a, a major figure. And actually, in the, uh, we have four anthropologists in the programs here. Uh, and uh, I think we all belong to the Council. But, and I, but uh, Harrington, Chuck Harrington, uh, was the editor of their journal for a few years here at Teachers College. We had it. So, we've had a strong connection. Um, and um, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to say about these early years and about the, uh, the formation of this department of um, philosophy. The d yeah, philosophy and social sciences? And yeah, I, uh, if I may a little bit, it's sort of, um, if one were doing a history of Teachers College uh, and wanted to trace sort of the ideological or organizational strands that both go together, structural and, and all that. It seems to me there's a curious kind of oscillation that goes on. Uh, there are periods in which uh, education is framed as being the schoolhouse, that is, the school, the f formal education. And activity is geared to that, and the organization of the curriculum and departments begins to go that way. There are other periods where uh, it's really 
education is more broadly defined as being essentially socialization so that it occurs everywhere all the time cradle to you know to the grave and uh, the, then the, the structure and the and the philosophy and the ideology is of a very different order i came just at the time when i think kremen was on the larger society scale uh, rather than the other side so it was uh, uh, less a teacher's college, that is, a normal school, which, by the way, I'm not making negative statements about this, but less that kind of a, for, a very formal, ins an institution looking at formal education uh, than one that was concerned with large, uh, so anthropology fits in very well, even curious things like fishing could be brought into something like this, that is, uh, the, the way people live, how they learn, how they, you know, how they teach, and so on down the line. So. Uh, this was, this was happening, and the division structure was interesting because uh, it, it, uh, it paralleled, the five divisions paralleled the five major activities, uh, curricular activities of the college, and organized the div departments uh, uh, accordingly. The one, the philosophy of the social science was to me the most interesting in retrospect. I was part of it in the beginning, but uh, in retrospect what it did was to provide systematically a way of getting history, philosophy, sociology, into the mainstream of the college itself. So there were courses open to everybody, and in many cases forced into, into these courses. And uh, it, then it also was allowed to uh, do two, two things, train its own people, to clone itself, let's get a few historians of education, anthropologists of education, and so on, and also uh, to uh, bridge uh, that wide gap between the college and the university. You, you know the old saying that the 120th Street is, is the widest street in the world. Uh, and in many ways it's true. Uh, and uh, it's interesting if you look at the history again of Teachers College, it oscillates between relatively strong relationships with the college, uh, with, the with, the, with the university, and very weak ones, and very nasty ones in many ways. That's all. Um, but, uh uh, am I wrong to say that uh, the Department of Anthropology at Columbia and the teaching of anthropology, whether it's division or department or what, a teacher's college has been relatively close uh, and intertwined? Well, the, the chairman, my friend Marvin Harris at that time when I came over, uh, uh, sent me over as the missionary. <laughs> Simon Kimball was very well known. He had been a, a colleague of, of Conrad Arensberg, who I mentioned before. Uh, but the relationship in anthropology, there was no real anthropology program going there. So supposedly we were going to unite all the clans of the anthropological tribe at, on Morningside Heights, as well as the, the medical uh, area the, up on 168th Street, where there is some anthropology. And in fact, that's what happened. So we were. Uh, I was, and my more senior colleagues were on the executive committee of the anthropology department. At the same time that we were here, we were involved in the in, uh, uh, selection of, of personnel and promotions on both sides of the street and so on down the line. So it was a very close kind of thing. And, we, and in fact, we interchanged students. In fact, there are two anthropology programs uh, that are exactly the same in terms of the curriculum, or almost the same. But they were there to come humbug the two administrations, Columbia and Teachers College. One is a joint program with the uh, anthropology department. It's called the joint, not hashish, but the joint program in, uh, in anthropology. The other one's called anthropology and education. Uh, but the joint program has put out uh, uh, some extremely, uh, uh, what's the proper word, uh, well trained and now a very important anthropologist, that is people who either were registered at Columbia or Teachers College, but were trained with us in the thing. And it worked out very well. It's changed a lot now because in fact the anthropology department has gone into, I won't call it a decline, but a very major shuffling over the last few years. So that's another, another question. Um, uh, you know, when you were talking earlier uh, about this uh, rise and fall of yeah. uh, different, uh, approaches. Um, this is what I understand uh, to be the theory versus practice issue at Teachers College. Well, Would it's, you another, it's another way of putting it, yeah. Um, and, and, w and so um, I'd like, to, which I find very interesting and uh, 
um, and I read in the, uh, the departmental literature on the web today that it's very important that people working in applied anthropology and uh, anthropology and education understand anthropological theory. Oh. Uh, so um, uh, it sounds like your department um, is very uh, much on the theory end of this theory practice uh, no. continuum. So, and, and I'd just like you to talk about that a little bit a in, in terms of anthropology teachers college and in terms of teachers college in general. Okay, let's start with anthropology first. Well, as I think I was saying a little uh, somewhat earlier, when we came, when I came here, and then when uh, Kimball, Kimball left, Kimball and I agreed on everything, but I was very happy to be the junior. And uh, it's, it wasn't a matter of status, that, that's how I conceived myself. I, 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 to being the junior meant that I could go do my own work and not worry about you know, signing papers and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, that's one of the problems of teachers' college because we have such small units that the, the, the junior people end up being very senior in terms of things very quickly and incorrectly. I'm, by, not that they do it badly, I'm just saying it, 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 it harms their career from, a, from, an, from an intellectual point of view. That's another question. But back then, uh, I, Kimball left and Kremen authorized the selection of two more anthropologists. And I kept saying, get yourself a senior anthropologist. And he kept saying, you're the senior anthropologist. I kept saying, go get lost, Larry. I can't. <laughs> anyway, we ended up getting two people. And it was a matter of selecting people uh, that seemed to me, since I was the only one left, um, straddled the intellectual areas that anthropology might be able to contribute to education and application. So it was really very broadly. Uh, something in psychology that is cultural and uh, cultural and personality or psychological anthropology because we have since education really is run by psychology from a theoretical point this would be useful uh, something in which Columbia did not have and, and many places in the United States did not have was a, a very well developed social anthropology which was something that was being done in Great Britain and France for decades before and very effectively, which seemed to me to make sense in terms of the study of educational uh, groupings, clusters, and so on. And uh, thirdly, the, the sort of the traditional cultural anthropology of American anthropology, which I represented, of course, in my full glory and splendor. And anyways, uh, but the, the, the thing there was that we would do this. And then we said, well, so how do we train people coming in? Now, mind you, think of it for a moment. There was the most prestigious Department of Anthropology in the country, 100 yards away. And here was this thing here. And said, so who is going to come here, and who's going to go there? Well, it turns out, of course, what happened in the beginning was that uh, um, Americans who were working overseas, or the occasional foreign student, who were involved in education in some way, or they thought they were involved, were coming here for a sabbatical or for a, a quick master's to go back home to do something. Uh, uh, I would wander around and find, and, but never had been in a, in, a, in, a, in a teacher's normal kind of school situation. We'd come in and find department school, you know, educational administration, what the hell is that, and all these sort of things and so on, and fell into something, well, anthropology began to make some sense because they were working in other cultures, other countries. So we ended up with this highly motivated older person than generally speaking in a graduate school you get people who just graduated from an undergraduate college. So we were getting people who were five or six years out, who were priests on their way out or nuns on their way in, all the combinations of this sort of thing. And they would come in and, uh, but they, they were motivated, they were hard working, but they knew very little social science. So we had to put together some way of, of being able to have them compete with their peers across the street, essentially, on exam. And we did this with a set of uh, uh, courses and techniques within those courses that had been developed more in Great Britain than in the United States, because we, and with a, a colloquium that ran two years and in which everything an anthropologist ever did in life was 
done and reviewed and done. And so we're, what we and what we said was very simply: if you want if you want a good applied anthropologist, he has to he or she has to know anthropology. So we could, how do you know anthropology? Well, you got damn well better know some theory, and then you have to meld that with practice immediately. So unlike my uh, growing up in anthropology and what is still being done, instead of sitting around in a graduate school for three years taking all sorts of brilliant courses and listening to brilliant mumbling professors, you are, you are, you are, uh, and then go out for a year without any preparation. In those days, you're sort of tapped on the back and male or female, and they said, when you come back, you're a man, you'll be a man, my boy or my girl, and uh, so on. Uh, what we did was try to prepare people to go to, for the practice and get them out the first year. They went out after, after nine months, for three months, come back, reconstruct that experience, build it into the coursework they're going to take, and prepare for the year, the year and a half they're going to go out later. So it was a, a very different process, and we had extraordinarily, from my point of view, very good results. We have, I mean, in anthropology, these are not, these are not uh, second-class citizens. We have six or seven department chairs at good universities, seven or eight deans are terrible people. <laughs> but uh, this sort of, I mean, you know, the, so the track record is very good. Um, uh, who were the, uh, the two, these two professors who you brought in? Uh, Originally? Yes. Uh, Chuck Harrington, who's still here, Charles Harrington. And uh, I say this with um, uh, William Bill Dalton, who is very sick today. I just got an email. He's, he's been, uh, he, he, went, he, left, he left Teachers College and went to the University of New Brunswick in Canada. He's retired, but his, his daughter emailed me today. He's in the hospital. Mm, but, uh, sorry you know, but those that. are the two. Billy was, uh, is, I, I shouldn't put him in the past, uh, it had been trained at Manchester, the University of Manchester, which was then the glorious Department of Anthropology in Great Britain, uh, run by a, a man named Max Glockman. Uh, these were people who worked pr primarily in the English or the former English territories of the Middle East. And, uh, the, the major influence on in things like the Israeli anthropology and so on. Uh, Billy was worked in Libya, and his um, uh, what's his name? He, he had a very close friend. He lived in a he worked in a wadi, which is an oasis, and the lieutenant of police there was a man named Gaddafi, who became who became of course the the, the dictator of Libya. So to, anyway. But Billy was, uh, is a very good anthropologist, and it was a very good, good for us because he brought in the, uh, the English uh, social anthropological component, which was sorely lacking. And, um, and you were going to, uh, after talking about this theory practice, uh, oh, well, as you bring it to teachers' yeah. college as a whole. Yeah, there it's, it's become interesting. And uh, I was listening to a discussion of our not about finances, but uh, this year's enrollment uh, from, from the, the deputy provost of the, uh, the other day. And he was commenting and th that something that seemed to me extraordinarily um, uh, obvious uh, over the past few years. What has happened, of course, is the divisional structure went out, uh, I guess it was with the beginning of the, t of the Levine administration, which was, well, what is that, about 19? Mid 90s? 90 something like that. Mid 90s? Yeah. yeah, I forget the exact date of it, but in any case, he essentially ended, well, what he did was to pull the divisions apart, and we ended up with nine departments. Now, the, the strength, I thought, of the divisional structure for the college was that uh, it made very clear the functions of each department and each division, and, and, it's, and it's, its relationship, uh, the, the departmental or divisional. Uh, relationship to the institution as a whole. So instead of saying, well, we now have a department called International and Transcultural Studies, whatever that quite means, it's a little bit unclear as to how that fits into, you know, the, the college or the outside or what. And so on. I'm not talking just about terminology. I'm just talking about, the, you know, the, 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 the clustering of, of, of individuals. So what has happened with these nine things is the, the function of philosophy and the social science was primarily from the institutional point of view, a service function. 
that this is the, the group that, uh, that, that provided the context of education to the people who are going to do education. And so you've got an, a sociological perspective, you've got an anthropological one. Whatever. I mean, you don't have to have more, but you had you know, access to this kind of thing. And the courses were geared to have people come in at all levels and so on and do that. What, what happened is, so that you have now have nine specialized departments, uh, supposedly specialized in some aspect of something, whatever it is. And, uh, and then you begin to, as you, as you look at the, uh, the, the uh, uh, bringing in of new personnel, the hires, that each, each of these departments is developing its own division of philosophy of the social sciences, their own nodule of people who are going to provide context rather than the thing, uh, which is very interesting, of course, it's really very needed, but organizationally, structurally, it seems to be actually moronic. You had it going before with, I mean, that aspect of it. And I think that's been the major failure in the, in the, in the, in the, in the shuffling. So I think uh, my colleagues in the practical, in the, the more professional aspects of education are well aware of the need for theory. That's not the point. But the emphasis really on uh, how the practice how to do it, and you know, I think we have a very good department of curriculum and teaching, and they get the the, the, the student teachers out there, and they get, and they train them, and they come back and they evaluate them, they do it very well, uh, and uh, and they and they tell them that you really ought to be reading X, Y, and Z, but that's not as systematically built in, I think, as it should be. This is just my opinion. Hmm. Interesting. So um, now uh, in the uh, Department of International and Transcultural Studies. Um, there are two divisions of anthropology. There are two programs. Two programs. And it's the uh, same faculty for both. There are four anthropologists. Uh, myself, George Bond, uh, Charles Harrington, Hervé Varenne. And, um, but is this theory practice division uh, uh, reflected in these two programs? In other words, no. Uh, no. Okay. They're exactly the same. Uh, there is a little bit more emphasis on the application of anthropology to education, uh, but, but not all that different from the applied anthropology. So it's, it's, it's I just did the other day signed off on somebody taking who's in the applied program whose specialization is education. That's not uh, the only the only difference literally is uh, there is uh, an approximation of the requirements for for something called the four field approach in anthropology. So the, in the applied program, since supposedly we're joint with the Columbia Department, uh, we ask our students to take besides courses in social and cultural anthropology, a course in either physical, linguistic, physical anthropology, linguistics, or archaeology. Uh, to give that flavor of the four field. And it's really kind of a, it's, uh, anachronistic a little bit because uh, the anthropology department has done away with the four field approach, but we still think it's important. Not that those courses, not, not that it's not enough to really do it. But that's, that's the only difference. And in fact, we tell people in anthropology and education to go take those courses anyway. They're not required. And, um, and uh, so yeah, this. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. No. I wonder if uh, this might be a good moment for you to talk about uh, some of the students that you've had over the years and the, um, you know, the people who you feel have really carried on the spirit of uh, anthropology and the way that you taught it and have uh, you know, done work that, uh, that you feel is particularly important um, or okay. just favorite students. Well. Tell you the prettiest. <laughs> uh, teachers, as you might expect, uh, there was a gender difference uh, between. I mean, anthropology always, um, unlike other disciplines, uh, social science disciplines, even at Columbia, uh, there were women in the field, or uh, women in in training in anthropology from day one. To, you know, certainly, you know, going back to me to Benedict, these these kinds of people. And uh, th they weren't given the jobs as readily, but they were there. At Teachers College, our student body, the first student body we had were 10 women and one male. And uh, there was a raid by Columbia for, on some of our students, and they took the one male. 
who is not the brightest of the lot. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have been really very successful in terms of uh, our students. Uh, we have two that uh, have gotten MacArthur Genius Awards that nobody, nobody at Teachers College has gotten. You know. uh, the two are, um, they're interesting. Uh, Shirley Bryce Heath, who is a professor now at, uh, at uh, Stanford and uh, very well known in questions of literacy. She's in, she wrote a great book on the Summer Institute of Linguistics, which is a missionary outfit that does language stuff in South America. And uh, she was the president or the vice president of the National Academy of Education, which is a very prestigious kind of thing. Uh, and she clearly deserved the award. The other one is in, is, uh, in another way much more interesting, uh, given administrative hurdles and leaps and bounds. Uh, a woman named Ruth Lubick, uh, who has been given some award by, by, uh, by Teachers College, but also got the, the MacArthur Award. Now, she, this is a woman who was a well-known nurse midwife. Uh, if you like the, the uh, kinship relationships, uh, her husband and I were fraternity brothers together at Columbia College. She was a young lady, a nurse at St. Luke's or wherever it was at that point. Uh, they married early, but uh, she became quite well known. And she wanted to do anthropology, but the anthropology department, wouldn't, or the graduate faculties would not let her in for the PhD because, like many nurses, did not have a liberal arts background, and there was this, the requirement. Uh, so uh, when I came over here, I knew, I knew her back then when she was denied tenure, and I was there. Uh, denied uh, admissions, and she, she came over here. I said, well, come over here. It's the same PhD, but you can you can do an EDD. So she's one of our very few EDDs, and she, she wanted to be a real anthropologist and go to New Guinea and dig holes and whatever you do in New Guinea. Uh, and I convinced her that she ought to do a thing on the OBG, uh, the, the, uh, nurse, the nurse midwife doctor conundrum problem. And what she did was, <laughs> a really slashing <laughs> cut at the medical fraternity, apparently, and uh, ran something called the Maternity Center in New York, which was in the leading midwife outfit. I know? had my children there. Really? So you know Ruth? I don't know her, oh. but I had my children there. And she now runs, she left the maternity center, for, uh, which she ran for, which, by the way, is now populated by Woody Allen and his, what is Woody, uh, and his wife. <laughs> the the building. The building, yes. Uh, but she, she still lives in New York, but has a, uh, a runs and organizes this huge thing on the, uh, uh, in Washington, uh, nurse, midwife, general clinic, which, she try, which she, she's really good at. But, and she's well into her 80s. Which, but then we've had sort of the classic, uh, uh, you know, uh, type anthropologists. Uh, there was a group that worked with me on, on um, the marijuana project in Jamaica. Uh, the, probably the best known of that is a, another nurse who became an anthropologist, Melanie Dreyer, who is now the dean of the Rush Medical University. So she's, in, she's the dean of the School of Nursing there and has been a, uh, involved. And she is, uh, uh, had written this absolutely gorgeous book or dissertation then book on uh, marijuana use in, Bol in Jamaica. Uh, it's very well known in uh, both research, anthropological circles, as well as nursing circles. She makes a straddle. And that's a very interesting, there was a very interesting program back then. The government gave out grants to um, people like Ruth, who didn't get one, but, uh, but certainly Melanie, uh, nurses who had uh, practic not practical degrees, but came out of non-liberal arts kind of thing. And, uh, who wanted to go on in graduate studies in something that might relate to nursing, but not necessarily. And a number came into our program from anth from, into anthropology from nursing. And Melanie was by far the most successful of the lot. She really combines it extremely well and so on. Uh, we have, uh, at the moment, a couple of, uh, of chair, uh, chair ladies. I get, I have, my feminist companions here I scream at me because I use the word the wrong terms all the time. But um, uh, Eugenia Georges, who wrote a, a very good book on the Dominican Republic migration, and uh, has been working more recently in Greece on medical anthropological subjects, is the chair at the at the anthropology at the at Rice University. 
and uh, Leslie Gill, another one, G I W L, -L uh, is um, chair at Vanderbilt. Then we have the equivalent at the University of Buenos Aires, in uh, uh, University of um, Pandion University in Greece. I mean, they're all over there. Really, uh, I'm always ama not always amazed, but I'm, I, I puff with some pride every once in a while when I think that we actually did get some good people out and doing things, and who are well respected in the field. It's not a matter that uh, they're sort of s slouching around at the edges at all. But, uh, but it seems that many of these uh, people did uh, what I would think of as medical anthropology. Well, Is that a, true? A, a, well, the, 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 they were some of the Jamaica stuff was the, on the anthropological side. Uh, what we did was to, was to provide, again, the context. We studied the communities in which these people came out of. They selected the people for, for, medical, for the medical study, which was done by the, the University of the West Indies medical faculty in hospital. But they were sort of the, so it's a medical study, but they were providing really the sociocultural data in which the, the medical stuff was, uh, was being used. Uh, by the way, that was a really uh, quite uh, uh, well-known study. It, uh, uh, it was very interesting the way it developed. Uh, the, we put together the book, Vera Rubin and I were the, the authors, and Vera got, uh, was a little older than I was, and uh, uh, I wouldn't say more middle classes. I don't know what I am, but uh, uh, she kept saying, this is remarkable. We have to you know, tell people about these great findings. The findings, of course, was that uh, and they were very careful findings that uh, the effects of marijuana, uh, long-term use, chronic use, on, uh, was negligible and from, a, from a negative point of view. And, uh, you know, and, and we got, uh, who was it? Uh, there was a very, Walter Sullivan, I think his name was, the science editor of the New York Times. Uh, and he wrote a three-page, you know those Times pages, uh, a three-page report on this study you know, glowing report was picked up by, I got clippings from 994 newspapers, you know, a little editorial blurb on, you know, the, the Waco wake or something, you know, Times Review. Uh, and, of course, a lot of uh, uh, the negative stuff came from the more formal organizations, uh, uh, people in government, uh, and so on down the line, but it was it, it was it was it, it's a really now quite a you know you have to quote this book whether you like it or you don't like it the results on would you so on say the line. title? Well, that's the, the point I was getting at the title. Um, so my colleague wanted to call it something like uh, I'm not quite the glorious uses of marijuana or something, and I said, listen, we got trouble with this one. We're going to be attacked on any numbers, and let's just keep it low key. So I said, we've got to make sure that it, it says the place in which it happened, so you can dismiss it if you like, or at least look at it. And uh, let's confuse people about what it's about, uh, the substance. So we use the Jamaican term for marijuana, ganja. So it's ganja in Jamaica, right? And, uh, but it got picked up very quickly. It's, it's, Ganja now is a quite, not because of us, but is a quite popular term. So. But it was very interesting. And she kept saying, well, what's wrong with doing this? And I said, Vera, I said, for God's sakes, it's, it's, you know, uh, calm yourself. I mean, you know, let things develop. She said, no, no, people must know about this. I said, well, I said, people are going to start screaming that you're, claim that you're urging them to, you know, to use marijuana. She says, no, I don't know. So I said, Vera, you have three grandchildren. You wanna, would you like them to, to start <laughs> smoking marijuana right now? <laughs> and uh, now I'm, uh, I'm all for marijuana. <laughs> oh, what are you talking about? Anyway, okay. Um, uh, on another subject, mm -hmm. um, uh, you've been here through uh, a number of presidents. And when you arrived, I think it was uh, John Fisher was president. and. Um, Larry Kremens became president, uh, and, Tim Payne, and Tim Payne, Levine. and uh, Arthur Levine, and now Susan Furman. And I wonder um, if you could just kind of uh, talk about how this institution has changed over time and uh, through the tenures of these people. I don't know if I can put it in those segments, but let me just start with one 
prescript, if that's the right word. Uh, at Columbia, I started in 1943, Nicholas Murray Butler was the president of Columbia. So I have had the presidents of Columbia for the entire cent century before. <laughs> okay, so I go back a long time. Uh, okay, John Fisher was a, uh, uh, when I came, was the president, was a, uh, a very interesting man, uh, very quiet. Uh, his uh, his uh, style was very much that of what he came out of. He was school superintendent in Baltimore, I think, before he came, and very successful with, with some of the issues. Uh, I think he his his great contribution was really to stabilize the institution, uh, which had gone on, undergone a few uh, crises, post World War II crises, in terms of uh, personnel, funding, and things of this sort. Uh, what was happening, I think, was that uh, there was a young group uh, stirring at, at about, you know, thinking back now, about the, the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, the older one of that group was, uh, I, from my perspective at least, was um, uh, R. R. Freeman Butts, who was called J. Butts, who uh, became uh, Entitled, but it was really not particularly essential here. But he became, a, I think, the associate dean for international research or something, uh, which was a very good thing. And, and in fact, founded something called the Institute of International Studies, which is I th back then very important. Uh, he was also the the the, uh, the mentor or the uh, sponsor of Larry Kremen's dissertation, uh, which meant they were both friends and enemies. These things always happen a little bit, I think. And there was, I think, a great deal of competition between, by competition, uh, I think mild by Columbia graduate school standards, which was much more vicious. This, this seemed to me a very polite place when I came here. I'm not quite so sure now, but it certainly seemed that way then in comparison to Robert Murphy and a few other people <laughs> at Columbia that existed. Okay. Uh, anyway, the... Um, uh, Th that, that group was, was beginning to, uh, they weren't plotting anything, but they did think in terms of, uh, they were all non-psychologists, and they were the inheritors of the mantle from people like Counts and others who were quite important uh, uh, figures uh, uh, who took social positions. And, uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, was happening is, uh, partly because of uh, the new, new resources for funding, was the money coming in to do outside research. So Columbia uh, Teachers College began to be involved with uh, a number of overseas projects. The most famous or infamous is the one in Afghanistan. Uh, we, uh, Teachers College was in Afghanistan you know, for years in the 50s. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember when it started, but it must have been the 50s. All the way through, they had a mission there with you know, 20, 30 people. They created the textbooks, they did all sorts of things. Yeah. And the same thing happening in Peru, and they were, they were moving into India, moving into, they had a, a, an operation in India, and Jay Butts essentially helped organize that and uh, helped fund it in an interesting way. I'm not absolutely sure of the details, but uh, uh, Columbia got a major grant from the Ford Foundation to help set up uh, the regional institutes. Uh, so we're at SIPA, uh, or the School of International and Public Affairs, did not exist then. This is in the, in the 50s. But they set up these uh, regional institutes, one on Latin America, one in Africa, one on uh, the Harriman Institute, which was doing Soviet studies and so on, down there, East Asia, and so on. Uh, and the Ford gave money for this thing. And I'm not quite sure how he did it, but Butts claimed that Teachers College should be in on this act. And I think got a million bucks out of, out of, out of it, which he helped, which helped found this operation with the, the international studies. Uh, essentially, the world, so there were, Kremen and Butts were in the same department, which then became a division. So in fact, Division I, Philosophy and the Social Sciences, only had one department. So it had one division director, and the same person was, was the chairman. I did that for 20 years or 18 years, something like that. Right, and it was very interesting what what that allowed things to happen. But the division of labor 
and the division of animosities and things uh, came with uh, Larry really doing the domestic side and Jay doing the, the, the international. They were perfectly cordial. I'm, not, I'm making too much of this. But in fact, the, uh, uh, we had, you know, some of us had both, ro both roles. Uh, but, uh, you know, there were people who were primarily sort of internationalists, you know, others who were more national. The historians tended to be uh, in, uh, na uh, domestic, like Larry, and, and his students, uh, who, were, who in their own right became quite well known. Robbie McClintock, who's still here, is retiring, I think, this year. Douglas Sloan. Diane Ravitch, who's a very famous figure in educational politics or policy. Uh, any number of people like that. And then on the other side, uh, uh, there were people like George Berday, who was Polish, uh, a Polish count. There's uh, lots of interesting stories about George Berday. Uh, uh, C.T. Hu, who was the uh, a member of the Kuomintang, the Chiang Kai-shek party, that got kicked out after the revolution. I think, think C.T. was a, a council or some sort of in the States when the government fell in China. A, became an academic, he was a historian, ended up doing that for us. And who else? We had uh, a number of people, the anthropologists, of course, who were into Saul Kimball ran the Peru operation for, for teachers' college and so on. Blah, blah, blah. But it was a very interesting group and uh, divided into this national and international. And at the buddings of all the things that occurred later on, not, uh, the things that occurred later on weren't all that great, but uh, and so on. Blah, blah. Okay, um, where were we on this? It's a um, well, I was just asking you to describe uh, oh, oh, the, I'm sorry, the okay. history of teachers' okay. college. So, so this was the beginning of that, of that sort of thing. And then uh, essentially, uh, uh, Fisher is, is, uh, uh, retires and, and Larry Kremen. And I think uh, Jay was a competitor for the, for the job. Or at least, it was very interesting. Uh, Jay was on the, on the committee to select the president, but was also considered a possible candidate. That was a little, but Larry comes in, and Larry doesn't, he doesn't, Larry wrote, of course, the great history of American uh, education tr uh, trilogy, and uh, was very much, uh, you know, uh, uh, saw education in very broad terms. I mean, he was an authority on schooling, but he understood the value of the, of, of the broad approach and essentially pushed that in the organization of the division that he had originally founded and, and headed and then kept up with. And he had brought in some, some people who are of like mind, Philip Phoenix, the great philosopher, uh, Jonas Soltis after him. Uh, uh, so there was but, he, but then, as president, I think, began to mold the place into this broader philosophical entity that I talked about, and did another thing that uh, I think was very important. By that time, by the time he came in, I think the gap between Teachers College and Columbia was getting wider. Larry Kremen was, I won't say beloved, but certainly very, very closely related to the Department of History at Columbia, which but then and probably now is, along with sociology, the most important department in, at, at the university and was an executive member and the whole thing. Uh, and he, uh, students from Columbia came to his courses. So there was this very nice bridge that was going on and he encouraged that. So in the division that he headed and set up, uh, there were the six, the six disciplines. We were told we, make, we can make whatever relationship we wanted uh, but he would like something to occur, and it could be done in a variety of ways. And in fact, anthropology was, you know, it was unclear whether we belonged to Columbia or teach, you know, in that sense, Columbia. So, and the sociology had a so somewhat different relationship, and so on down the line. But it was very, very useful that aspect of it. Uh, the intellectual bridges, the uh, the academic kinds of things, the uh, the ability of students to go from one place to another which doesn't occur even now. It's a, you know, all sorts of barriers and hurdles that are set up because of economic reasons. There are differences, for example, in, in tuition rates. There are differences in this. Like, you know there's an exchange of money at the end of the year between Columbia and Teachers College. 
sometimes negative, sometimes positive, depending on which side you're on, you know, who took how many courses, all the rest of that kind of thing. So you can see how deans get involved in chopping, chopping the bridge down, I think, more than anything else. Uh, Kremen was very good at that, and um, uh, I think um, uh, really spread the popularity or the respectability of Teachers College in both the, edu the educational world, that is, uh, our only competitor, the major competitor of Teachers College in education is the Harvard School of Education. There are others that come close, but those are the two traditional. And I think Larry made very clear that we were in that game and we did it very well. So Harvard, Harvard stressing the intellectual, I think a little bit more than the practical at that point. Uh, so I, from my point of view, maybe it's the golden age for me that this, this I thought was the most positive period uh, of teacher scholars and, and certainly for me in terms of, uh, well he was very good to me, I, I got promoted from assistant professor to full professor in a year and a half, that's pretty good, <laughs> without asking. <laughs> and Larry was, well, it was interesting. When we moved into the, uh, uh, into the Tim Payne thing, I think things, Tim Payne was an interesting man, he had been at the, Ra the Rand Corporation, uh, but he was, um, his background was a little bit, uh, bureaucratic is not the right word, it's, uh, it's, it's too loaded, but very much in terms of, uh, uh, much more familiar with the kind of a corporate model of things. So it was during his administration, I think, that we went from, before Larry and before, before John Fisher, the, the person who ran teacher's college was called, not president, but dean. In fact, uh, even now, the president of teacher's college is the dean of education for Columbia University. And it, it should, you know, there should be much more relationship, but there, there isn't. Uh, and uh, what happened was that uh, uh, with, uh, and then of course we had, uh, you know, very quickly our president. A uh, president has to have a dean. A dean has to have maybe a provost or something. And you began to get this kind of enlargement. But when I came here, the professional staff and the, sort of the senior administrative staff was really quite minimal. I mean, you know, there was, I, I kind of remember three old ladies with green eye shades, and everything was done on time, handwritten, and it got to you. You knew everybody that was going to teach, you were going to teach the day they, they came to class. Now the computers, you know, take a semester or two to catch up. <laughs> this is, this is okay. uh, that's my golden age stuff. It's, but the professional, the professional staff was, was, was much more. With Tim Payne, it's not that he grew the place. Uh, but what he, uh, he said, he, we now had, in fact, put into effect by statute, a president, three vice presidents, three assistant vice, you know, the, the, it was the beginning of the corporate model, where everything began to try to adjust towards some sort of a corporate model, which I think in the long run had a great, has a great deal of effect on institutions like this. Part of the problem for teachers college in this, of course, is that, uh, uh, yeah, it's a separate corporation, but it's still a sort of, um, there is a Siamese twin relationship with this larger, big fat twin house over there. And, uh, it affects fundraising, it affects everything. I mean, you go, you know, teachers college presidents go to X and they, they say, we've already given a, you know, <laughs> to you guys. Uh, nobody makes a distinction between Columbia and teachers college, not many. Anyway, so there is this, there is this kind of problem uh, that has existed. Uh, uh, so, and uh, uh, Tim Payne, again, was uh, quite mild. Uh, uh, there was nothing particularly dramatic that he, that he under, undertook during his, his administration. Uh, it, the change comes with the Levine, uh, uh, dress, that is, the structural changes that impacted everything. Levine, uh, came what, uh, Sperman's been here, I think uh, this is a fifth year, I think, so the 10 years before Furman came, uh, the 12 years actually before Furman came, uh, Levine was president. And uh, the first year or two, we essentially uh, talked to people and asked people to come down and so on. And then he announced essentially that uh, 
they, he was just doing away with the divisional structure and then everybody could go wherever they wanted, essentially. It was kind of loosely put. And this, of course, engendered all sorts of problems. I only know specifically about my own, our own end, that is, where does anthropology go? I was then the division director, I guess still division director, of philosophy and the social sciences. And this was apparently seen, if I can as I say, speak off camera, why not? Uh, I, I think Levine saw uh, philosophy and the social sciences being the last political hurdle he had in the place. I'm not sure why he thought it was a hurdle or why he should worry about it. But, uh, uh, and uh, we were essentially told to go find, uh, you know, distribute ourselves somehow. And I found this a rather funny sort, uh, sort of thing. And um, uh, finally we were told that we were all going to be broken up and, and people went off in various directions, leaving behind the, uh, the, the only unit I could keep a toe of, the anthropologist. And then we were four anthropologists with nowhere to go, right? I kept saying, why don't you just leave us alone? You can call us anything you want. But finally we ended up in a new department. It was called the Department of Scientific Foundations, which sounded to me like a girdle factory. I don't <laughs> Actually, it was a very nice group, but it had nothing, the group had nothing to do with each other. It was a problem. And we were then announced at some couple of years later that uh, we each got a letter in anthropology saying, you are all, go, go find yourself individually a place to stay, and clearly announcing the end of anthropology. I said, and I screamed and yelled uh, to everybody that I could find to scream and yell at. And we actually kept the department together, and, and uh, the, the program together, and moved to ITS, Inst International and Transcultural Studies. Uh, I'm not quite sure they really wanted us, but uh, we went there. But, but what it was, it was this, this, this period of complete uh, uh, restructuring, which had its effect, its impact on all the, I won't call them the traditional, but all the rules, the curricular rules and regulations that tied departments together, that tied the various intellectual strands together. Because there are all sorts of requirements where people take three courses outside of your department to do this and to do that. And there are all sorts of arrangements made over you know, a decade or two or three uh, to facilitate this and do it with some, you know, uh, with some efficiency. And this all went out the window and it still hasn't been put the back together. I happen to be at the moment chairman of uh, the faculty executive committee, which, which uh, con supposedly controls the, uh, the uh, academic program of the, of the college. And uh, everything that comes up is a matter of, you know, the problems are all, all could have been handled if the old structure or something like it had remained uh, with, with all sorts of amendments. But this, I don't call it a new thing, it's no longer new, it's part and parcel of the place. But we're still staggering through, I think, a little bit of that, a great deal of that. And Furman inherits that. And uh, uh, it's unclear. It's, it's, it, uh, Furman, I think, has been uh, uh, very good about putting us on the map again. She is. Currently, I think, a member of the president of the National Academy of Education, which is very good for us, and uh, is very much involved with uh, uh, local level politics as they have to do with, with education. Kremen uh, really didn't, uh, except in a very global sort of way, but uh, Susan has hands on on this with a lot, a lot of things. Well, she's uh, also interested in uh, creating a uh, p department of policy. Ah, yes, to be discussed at great length by the fact the executive committee. This is an interesting issue. Um, yeah, she, she herself was uh, technically a student at the time I was chairman of the department that she graduated from. <laughs> uh, she was in, uh, she got her degree under Donna Shalala, who is very well known, who was the political scientist in the Department of Philosophy and the Social Sciences at that time. And uh, she, uh, uh, so, her, so her interests are very much in this sort of thing. And uh, as dean at the, at the School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania, she did a lot of policy work. In fact, her, her academic interests are really with uh, school financing, this sort of thing. And uh, so she, in fact, very, you know, very happy with the, the idea of a policy department and very much behind it. 
It's been an interesting issue because it, uh, uh, a, a number of us are worried about um, the consequences of this to the rest of the institution because it's not a matter of, of bringing in 10 new people. It's a matter of extracting seven, eight, nine, ten 10 people from other departments and then what do you do with the other departments? How do you refigure them? How do, this, this is the step we're just about entering. And it's going to, I think, raise all sorts of issues. I happen to be in one department, which is very much affected by this. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the International Transcultural Department had two disciplines, economics and anthropology. Economics is now part of policy, or will be part of policy, leaving this sort of tail, anthropological tail dangling in the wind. What is it going to be replaced by? Should it be replaced by it? Should there be a new configuration? Who's going to pay for it? Become interesting issues. Uh, it's, it's, I think, uh, I think uh, Furman is not only have a, has a right, but uh, there's no, absolutely nothing wrong with setting up a new department. But uh, there are all sorts of headaches in doing it within this, you know, with restricted, uh, um, yeah, resources at this point. Okay, you know, thank you. I don't know. Um, we're beginning again with Professor Lampos Kamitas. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the institutes at Teachers College. First, generally, uh, you know, how do institutes come to be? You talked a little bit about how the institute, um, which, what was the name? The Institute of International yeah, Studies right. began. Um, and I'd like you to talk about that institute and the work you did there and why I couldn't find it when I Googled it at, and when I went on the Teachers College website and couldn't find it. And then about uh, your own institute, um, the Kamitas Institute for Anthropological Study. So could you talk about... I'm just keep telling you, but I named after my father. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I'm on a committee actually at the moment on something called Centers and Institutes in which the, inst the organization, Teachers College, is trying to figure out what these centers and institutes are and how they come about, and maybe we can do something about it. Uh, the, it's, a, it's interesting. There is no real process. And you know, centers have popped up. And institutes, the only real difference is institutes are supposed to be approved by the Board of Trustees. And so they're permanent kind of thing. Besides, beyond that, and it's unclear to me how they, and there are not very many institutes at the college. Uh, none of them, with the exception of the Institute of, Inter of the, the Urban and, Min and Minority Education, uh, uh, which has had a, a long, uh, I'm sure that Ed Gordon may, may have mentioned it, uh, the, uh, that has had an active career, uh, ups and downs, but it's, it's been there. In fact, now has space in the old Hotel Teresa, where Castro once, once sat. That's an interesting period of, of Teachers College history when Castro arrived up on the other side of Morningside Heights. Okay. Um, the um, okay, the reason I'm that... I'm sorry. Do you so Okay. We were talking about the, uh, the institutes and centers, I think, yes. at, at Teachers College. Uh, as I said, I don't, there is no set process. In fact, we're trying to, de we're trying to develop one in terms of the, the introduction, the maintenance, uh, the appropriateness of particular uh, centers and institutes. The difference between uh, institutes and, and centers, as I've just mentioned, is that uh, uh, institutes are um, approved and certified by the board. Uh, and we've had a couple of those in the past. So there's, there, I think now the Institute of Technology, which exists, the UMI, which is the Urban and Minority uh, Education. Uh, there's on, on the Institute of International Studies. Let me just say a word about the latter uh, to put it into perspective. Um, our Freeman Butts, or Jay Butts, as he was called, uh, was the, actually founded the institute just about, I think, the time I came to Teachers College. I met, he probably did it in about 62, 63. I came in 64. He, uh, and it was essentially to uh, uh, deal with the money and the, uh, uh, and the expectations placed upon Teachers College in, in, the, in the international field. And he was quite good at it. He organized a, a staff. He got ex extremely good people. We ended up with uh, 
uh, with a parallel faculty, actually, uh, people who were quite expert on things Afghanistan, things Peruvian, and uh, who were clearly the equivalent or better than the locals here who remain in the faculty. That, become an, uh, that became another issue toward the end of these projects. What happens to them? Who do they belong to? Do they have any? Do we have any responsibility and so on? But uh, so he, he set up this operation, and the way he structured it was interesting. Uh, there was the Institute of International Studies, and then he, on his own volition and his own authority, because I don't remember anything more than that, set up uh, a series of centers that dealt with specific regions. So there was the Institute of International Studies, and there was a center for education in Latin America. I was then the uh, two-year-old director of it. Uh, there was a center for uh, African studies, David Scanlon, who uh, was an interesting figure who very rarely is mentioned in Teachers College uh, accounts. Uh, a, uh, uh, an educator with, I think, political science uh, background who was very active in the Biafra War in, uh, in Nigeria on the uh, humanitarian side and picked up some nasty disease which finally killed him you know, five, ten years later. But we had these f five or six centers that operated, each with its own director, with budgets allocated by the, uh, by the institute director, which was Butts, uh, the responsible for publication. Each center had its own publications. We put out ten books, I think, in my center. Any number of things of this sort. We, you know, we, we funded students. We encouraged conferences and so on, things that centers should do. And it was a very good operation. Um, the money began to dry up. Mo much of the money uh, was coming in those days out of AID, the Agency for International Development, the government, and for specific projects. So there was a project in Peru. In, uh, oh, we also uh, were very active in something called Teachers for East Africa. This was pre-Peace Corps. They began, then became sort of a Peace Corps operation. And so on. so it, was, it did a lot of things on the international front. Uh, uh, of, of quality and so on. In fact, my first exposure to, uh, to Teachers College uh, senior faculty was, uh, I had been, a, uh, my first appointment was in, in September of 64, but I was then on leave from Colombia and working in Bolivia. So they gave me a, uh, a semester leave of absence without pay, I was, so I, I should arrive in February. And on the way back, they said, stop. I was in Bolivia. Stop in Lima and see our operation. So I saw Teachers College in operation uh, back then this, that way. Anyway, uh, as I said, there is no set thing. And what happens with uh, we have 40 or 50 or 60 of these things on the books centers. And most of them really come. Somebody gets a grant to do something for two or three years and sets it up as a center. And then it's how it remains in the book. The project goes away, or the faculty member goes away. It remains, the center remains, but nobody's doing anything with it. And this kind of, this, this kind of half-life that goes on. So there's, th this has been a problem. The, actually, when Jay Butts retired, and retirement then was mandatory in 65, uh, nothing was done about the institute. And uh, I don't remember any discussion about this. It just disappeared. And uh, during the, I was then, I'd been the, and was the, uh, the director of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia, which is another issue, by the way, that is Colum teachers college people involved with Columbia and vice versa, and the politics of that type of thing. But, uh, uh, and when my term came up, I think I've, done 10 years or that somewhere. I asked in pain whether I could have the institute back uh, to be able to put our resources back into something like that. He didn't quite know what the institute was. He says, yeah, sure. And it got the appropriate paperwork done. And so I've been that all, all my life, but I don't think Furman knows that it exists. <laughs> Certainly we don't get any money out of the institute. And still, it's, I won't say it's a paper operation. We essentially run the Fulbright program and things like that things of this sort. Uh, but it, uh, the, there is no coherent use of centers and, and, and institutes here. And it's an, it really is necessary because there are many interests faculty people have that are beyond straight teaching. 
and, in, and individual research. And it has, so we had set up the center, this, um, this, this uh, group of, the dean appointed a group of four or five people to uh, put together a position paper we brought in experts on, on doing this at universities, you know, the usual sort of uh, kind of uh, uh, rigmarole on this. But we uh, put out, a, I think, a very serious policy paper on how to, how to get to grips with this. And we're in the process of doing that now. So mm. My institute is, uh, is, is really is linked to um, Teachers College, uh, not by accident, but uh, it's, I, I don't consider it a Teachers College thing because it was set up uh, uh, just to, uh, I, I was the director of another institute. I'm a big shot at institutes. Uh, actually, I spent a lot of time on them. Uh, the, I mentioned Vera Rubin, I mentioned this group that I went early on, we, I went to Barbados. That thing developed into a separate thing called the Research Institute for the Study of Man. And uh, it was uh, located in a gorgeous building on the east side, uh, townhouse, not, not a, uh, and uh, she was the founder and director, and I was the associate director, well I had a day job here. And uh, for she died in '85, and I became the director of that until 2000 or something. And uh, it was a gorgeous operation, very different from anything else because it, if you look at research institutes or centers at universities, the way they they operated in the past and still do to a considerable extent, they operate on soft money. So the staff is busily writing proposals uh, for the next year, the two years, uh, using the money that they had. To do the research the first time around, and it's a very difficult kind of a process. This one was we had uh, uh, funding. We had a building that was that w we had we owned the, the research institute. We, we had a, a core staff, which with the money uh, we 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 were we got as a matter of statute practically every year. So all we had to do was uh, do whatever we wanted. So we developed a very good uh, reputation and people would come to us, not people, but organizations, agencies. So we did the Ganja study, the Jamaica study. We did a very major study in Bolivia uh, for the Peace Corps. We did all sorts of things. And I ran most of it. It was a great experience for me. I could do a, both anthropological straight research on my own, or I could run the, op the operation or some combination of that. And uh, that was, uh, you know, when I, when I think back of it, back to it a little bit, I sometimes think that it held me back was I could have I had all these offers to go to these exotic universities, for, but I was always kept back by that, and uh, it was. Uh, but that allowed me certain freedoms that assistant professors and associate professors never had, n never will have within the within the university. It's, but so, that was not affiliated with Teachers College. Well, it was, and I mean, Larry Kremen loved my relationship to this thing. Uh, uh, I, I didn't take away from my time here. I did all you know, my time, but all the personnel and all the pro and I, I used my program to feed those things. I funded my own students through that. It, uh, anthropology didn't cost Teachers College a cent when I was operating that that kind of thing, and uh, it it probably produced the the relationships about twenty dissertations, twenty PhDs over time. Mm -hmm. Teachers College did. Degrees with that, so it was very, very useful from an institutional point of view. But it was it was unusual because it didn't uh, uh, the, it was not in the business of raising money to to kill it, you know. To uh, so everything we got, I remember we run, we run we get. Uh, I was uh, I was um, somebody's writing a book on marijuana in California. Called me up the other day and said. Uh, could you give me some facts on the Ganja project? I said, well, what do you want to know? He said, he had it all wrong about something. He says, well, I want to know the amount of money. Uh, it was $6 million you got right for this project. I said, where did you hear that? No, it's true. I mean, everybody knows it. It was $200,000, right? That's a big difference, right? And we ran $200,000 without taking any overhead. In fact, Vera Rubin was rich. She put money into it. You know, it, it was a very diff it's a very different, it was a very different kind of operation. Mm -hmm. No longer exists in this fashion anymore. But and what about uh, the Comitas Institute for Anthropology? All right. So what it, that was was really not my revenge on the research institute, but uh, 
I, I began to try to figure out ways of uh, salvaging a lot of material that we had collected uh, at, the, at the Research Institute that were uh, fundamentally my prop and property, the things that I had worked on. And I began to put them in, and all was, not all of a sudden, but it became a kind of resource thing. A lot of Caribbean materials, uh, a lot of the work that I was involved with, a couple of very important databases that I, that I put together, bibliographic and uh, annotational and so on down the line. So I think of it as a kind of a service, not quite to humanity, but to some obscure band of anthropologists out there and in, so in the year 2,800. <laughs> So, and, and, and is that affiliated with Teachers College? Well, it's, it goes through their service, so they list it, and, uh, and since they, if they don't object, I don't mind, you know, it's no, no problem. <laughs> um, and I see that uh, the, um, uh, the anthropology department now also has a journal of anthropological research for, that's been uh, It's a student uh, yeah. online thing, which, is, uh, which I started a couple of years ago, which is a very nice idea, and they put their, most, most of their own stuff, they ask for papers from outside, but they essentially want to get graduate student uh, material. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, you know, I, um, I want to ask you a whole bunch of questions, but you know, when you mentioned this thing about Castro, uh, oh, I, 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 I mean, It wasn't quite teacher's of, college, but it, well, you, well, it wasn't, what was well, it? Well, Castro, when the first year of his ascendancy, he was, of course, a, he was considered a very big man and very important, and everybody liked him. And uh, he came to, gave a speech in the UN, and he took, uh, he took up rooms in Harlem at the Hotel Teresa, right? And uh, mobs were outside, you know, chanting his name. And I was there one night doing this, and he was throwing chickens out the window. It was sort of quite a, a glorious operation. And a lot of teachers' college <laughs> types were around. <laughs> um, but that was, well, actually it was, I shouldn't say, it, the teachers' college types were around, but uh, it, was, it was 19, it could have had to be about 1960. Or 61, I was still across the street. So formally, I was Columbia, not teacher's car. Well, I see, okay. okay. Um, so um, how would you say uh, teacher's college is different from other graduate schools? What makes this different? Exactly the relationship or the non-relationship with Columbia. It is, a, uh, it is the uh, one of, uh, it's, very, it's a very rare configuration. Uh, the, Almost all schools of education in uh, the United States are, are attached to a university completely. They are departments of education of a university. If you look at Stanford, look at you know, Harvard, th th this way. Now, it doesn't seem significant, but it's truly significant because uh, you can do a, a, any number of different kinds of things or not do things. Uh, the, the base, I mean, the value of being part of, absolute part of a university is that you, are, that you can use the other departments fully, just like any other relationship, so, which you can't quite do here. You have to negotiate that quite a lot. But uh, it allows you to become either a micro-university, which is essentially what uh, Kremen made the place, that has broadened it out in terms of the curriculum, or it allows it to be narrow, if you like, Right now, uh, with the pressure, uh, political pressures on education, you know, my fear is that we're going to become much more of a, a normal school. That is, we're going to try to produce better teachers. And, and how do you do that? Well, you cut back on the other garbage, and you, you get you, you stay with the with the strictly educational, practical material. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm very but th that is the critical difference. And I don't think there is a major organization in education that has the same non-relationship to a university, but is part of it in some way. It's a, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's a... And because ultimately it, it can be more independent? And, or ultimately, not ultimately, but also dependent in a curious way. Or it's, uh, it's constrained by its relationship, one way or the other. It, could, it, it can be positive, and, it's, it's, and again, I see it as oscillating, depending very much on, on, the, on the actors or the players. The, uh, the, the graduate dean, in a sense, plays an important role in this thing, because in fact, the PhD programs that we run are all under the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Now, they pass rules over there, for example, fundamental things. They're, going, they're into fully funding their graduate programs. 
So if you take anthropology I'll give you, at Columbia straight, uh, traditionally, uh, certainly in the 70s, but I even in the 50s when I was there, the uh, Columbia admitted 60, 70 people the first year and cleaned them out at the end of the first year with a series of examina two examinations and got down to 15 people for the second year. Now they accept four or five people, period, who are fully funded for five years plus everything else, and they get a stipend of $17,000, $18,000. Our poor characters don't get a cent, don't get anything, I mean, it's a very different, but they're in the same, under the same rubric, same set of guidelines, and a lot of pressure from the graduate faculty is, why don't you fund your students? Well, teachers' college can't. I mean, we operate with, uh, I don't remember the percentage, tuition, I think, is, uh, uh, brings in about 85% of our costs, something like that. This varies a little bit. Teachers' College, uh, Columbia, uh, even when I was there, was about 8%, and even that. But now what happens, what has happened to anthropology, of course, is that the, instead of a student body of, uh, that, can, uh, that can take courses, you know, of 70, 80, 90 people, with a staff of 25, faculty of 25, they have five or six, and the 25 people are teaching undergraduate courses in all sorts of things, and it's, it's not a very meaningful operation for the, for the, for the, for the perpetuation or the, the training of anthropology. One might say maybe that's a good thing because maybe there are not gonna be very many more jobs for anthropology. That's another, that's another question. So. Hmm. Um, and how would you say that uh, Teachers College has been about supporting your work. In a very positive sense, they never interfered with it. Uh, and they never told me what I should do. Uh, that is, uh, maybe it's because, and it may very well be because I was in a uh, very protected space and climate coming in, that is, that, that philosophy and social science group, and made head of it, not head of it, well, I did become head of it later on, but certainly in the beginning it was, I was anointed the senior anthropologist when I was, you know, two years old, running around. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Kremen's dictum was very clear, uh, you guys better teach some, some good service courses, and then you do what you tell, what you tell. Actually, it was very interesting, and he listened very carefully because um, somewhere in the 70s, uh, he was then head of the National Academy, uh, of, the, of the Spencer Foundation, and uh, he was trying to broaden that out. Spencer only gave money in those days to psychology, to psychologists, and the money that Spencer gave to his foundation, uh, he made by uh, uh, creating uh, tests, you know, psychological tests, enormous revenues. It's a very rich foundation. When Kremen came in, he wanted to spread it out a little bit, and he appointed committees to do this, and he, he asked me to run the co a committee on anthropology and education. And in fact, uh, a lot of this came out of conversations earlier on as, what do you want to do with anthropology here at Teachers College? And he was really, really quite approving and so on. And he had a very broad sense, uh, sense of it. So from my point of view, personally, I, and uh, certainly, I, I, certainly I can say that the, my, uh, uh, my colleagues in anthropology never st suffered from anybody uh, in a senior position, let's say me in this thing, uh, telling them what to do on anything. In fact, uh, I was always very happy when, when people would, would, would uh, strike out in, in, in a variety of dire in directions. Uh, the, the, um, what are, the ne what are the negative sides? Well, unlike an extremely rich place, it didn't provide pools of money for you to go try it out. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, well, we don't have a very uh, efficient or very large uh, staff for uh, you know, writing of proposals and research, this kind of thing, uh, where, where most of the expertise there is limited to sort of formal educational things. That is, what is the Office of Education doing? They pass around, you know, the uh, uh, RFPs or so, you know, requests for proposals, this, this sort of thing. So it's a, uh, it's, it's, 
it depends very much on the individual and the situation. But I think, you know, in the main, we've been, you know, uh, the place has been very supportive, you know, in that sense, ideologically. So I, I have had, never had a problem with it. Um, totally. you know, it went again. Just Um, teachers College, when Teachers College um, writes about itself, people write about here write about Teachers College, they talk a lot about its legacy of innovation. Um, and um, I wonder uh, if you think that <laughs> there has been great innovation here during your time. And what, well, what are some of the innovative moments that stand out? in your mind, in your own work, in the work of the institution, and in other people's work while you were here? I mean, this. this yeah, I, I'm not, prob I'm probably not the, the right person to give you a, 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 a comprehensive uh, response on this, uh, but uh, again, I think it, the innovations uh, in the main were probably curriculum. That is, they, not, not that we ended up with a core curriculum like Columbia College in the 1910s or 1920s, but that uh, uh, particularly under Kremen there was a, a, uh, a liberalization or a liberal arts university ideology that floated through the place, with a lot of opposition, by the way, from the more practical people, saying, what the hell is he, think he's doing this sort of, sort of thing. Uh, and I think we were, uh, our reputation generally in, in academic circles rose, that is. Uh, I think we've contributed very strongly to uh, the, uh, much more so than our major competitors, to uh, the um, uh, more, theoretical aspects of, uh, of education or the issues in education. So that, uh, and particularly the work of the historians, I think in this case, some of the work of, in sociology. Uh, Can you anthropology could, could a little you specify? Uh, well, history clearly, uh, Kremen, but also his students. I mean, whether you like it or not, or, or from an ideological point of view, Ravitch is all over the lot. Uh, uh, Douglas Sloan, uh, who worked, who was a student of Kremen, Robbie McClintock, again, these are, uh, in education, are major figures, uh, and particularly in history. Uh, in sociology, we had uh, uh, people in the past, and I'm not quite sure whether they really count, but some of them are very eminent. Herb Gans, who was a sociologist when I came into the department, he was an assistant professor then, and as, uh, he left Teachers College to go to the uh, sociology department as the urban professor of something or other. I mean, he literally, and uh, his, uh, his work I particularly like because it's, it's more anthropological than, than sociological as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, uh, but uh, Bob Dentler, who became the, uh, I think, dean at, at BU, in, he was a sociologist. Uh, George Baraday was an interesting character. He was a professor of comparative education but essentially trained in the sociology of education at Harvard. He was, uh, there was he was a, somebody in the, in the profile of the history of whatever, it's, of Teachers College, somebody should have a little section on George Bird. Uh, he was a, a Polish, uh, it's unclear, a nobleman. He put on many, many forms and he was always, he, uh, when you thought he was really just being bombastic, it turned out that he would be, that he was right. But um, he apparently, the story goes, which he told, it goes something like this. Uh, he, his parents want, he grew, up in, he, he grew up in Poland, and his parents wanted him to become a priest. So they sent him with another young man to Rome to, find, to verify his vocation. I'm not quite sure it goes. The story goes that he was told by his elders or whatever they were, 
to go to the Sistine Chapel and to lie flat on their face all night long, and then they would know or something. And he says, and Lambros, I should tell you, when I got up, I decided to go to the military academy. <laughs> and I said, and what happened to the other young man? And the other one became the Pope. And it turned out that this was true. Because <laughs> one day, I apparently got a call in Chile to go to, to, go to, to, go to, where, to Rio. He says, I have to leave. I heard the story, I was not there, but somebody told me in the police, I have to leave because I have to go to a lunch and I'll be back tomorrow in Santiago. I said, well, well why are you going? He says, the Pope invited me to <laughs> lunch. <laughs> anyway, but he apparently was, uh, he tilted against the Germans, ended up in England, jumped at Arnhem, and he says, I jumped the lieutenant and I landed as a colonel. <laughs> 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 but he was a character, but uh, and very interesting in terms of uh, what he brought to the, you know, to the to the department, to the college, in terms of some of the international stuff. It was uh, in those days we didn't really have all that many foreign uh, that is people who were trained abroad, you know, grew up abroad, mm -hmm. and this I think was useful too. Well, there was an innovation, I should not an innovation, but a, 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 a something that happened here that was important. Teachers College was responsible, for good or for bad, for the training of uh, black Southern teachers. And somewhere in the 30s and 40s, there were these summer programs that brought up uh, masses, like tons of them. Uh, some of my colleagues, uh, some of my black colleagues, they said this was a disservice, and of course they, I don't know quite all the details on this, but um, I think Teachers College thought it was doing the, the, a good thing and helping the cause. And uh, we've had, uh, from that point of view, we've always had a, uh, a very diverse uh, student body. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not half black uh, and it's not half foreign, but we do have a, a quite diverse group compared to anything. I think maybe the engineering school is different. They happen to be all Japanese for some reason. <laughs> and Greek instructors, I find a curious combination. <laughs> 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 Um, well, let's, um, let's talk about uh, the future for a minute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, at your age, I mean, what concerns you most about uh, this institution and keeping it relevant in the future? There are, again, a couple of levels of this. Uh, in my, from my point of view, not from my, from my perspective, I have two kinds of anxieties. One is, uh, so I help found this program, which as far as I'm concerned, has been quite successful, maybe others don't. And, and most people at Teachers College couldn't care less whether there's an anthropology program or anything else like that. Uh, but we put out 110 PhDs, we've done, we, uh, we were the, for a while the fifth largest producers of anthropologists in the country. <laughs> If you can imagine that with a, with a faculty of four. But, and it wasn't trash. As, uh, but, so it's what's going to happen to this thing? We, uh, uh, one of the problems that the, that the disciplines, when they remain strictly disciplinary programs, is that they're never, they're, they have a great deal of difficulty getting permission to, uh, to recruit anybody, even if somebody leaves, dies, or something else. Now what we've had in this program is four people who've been here for you know, 30, 40 years each. It, uh, it is, I can, I'm not gonna tell you the, the, the actual figure, but uh, we have the oldest, scarcely living program <laughs> of anthropology. Not oldest program, but oldest age group in the, ever put together, and it's in the mid 70s if you can believe it with no possibility of, as far as I can tell, of recruitment. So there's that kind of thing. But I am concerned, I think, with, um, I'd, it isn't just golden days. It really is uh, that it was great during the, the 60s and 70s. Uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, I am concerned with its, with its present structure and what's going to be done with it, and particularly whether how the Columbia relationship will be will be dealt with. Uh, I can see the benefit of not being part of Columbia, and I can see the, the, the real benefit. And again, going back to individuals, you know, it's been very interesting. We've, 
Uh, and if you take anthropology, we had, in the, in the days when I came as the missionary, and then for 10, 20 years later, we had a very nice flow back and forth, and, uh, and people who made no difference where they were registered or anything. Uh, because of one or two nasty people on the other side, it wasn't Robert Murphy, uh, who actually, uh, who I think really didn't like me at all, but could, uh, uh, permitted my existence and thought teachers call it check. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm only joking. Uh, but one or two others who uh, uh, kept, uh, began to, to, to keep students at home. So all of a sudden the flow stops, for no structural reason, but the flow stops. And this happens, these kinds of things occur. Somebody changes something, and then, it, because there is no, there are no real bridges that, that cannot be destroyed, the thing breaks down. And I think we have to come to a little bit more to grips with it. But I think um, uh, Teachers College is lucky. In, uh, the uh, new provost of, of Columbia, Steele, uh, Claude Steele, I think, is uh, a friend that has had experience with Teachers College, has been at Teachers College, and. Uh, uh, this promises for a, a really bright new day coming on in terms of relationships and opening, and I'm very hopeful about that. Uh, listen, the, the real problem, of course, is the problems of education, the cost of education and so on. This place depends on this thing. We've had, at a time when they're trying to cut back on the benefits of, the ret of retirees, which is a, now the current issue going on, we, uh, uh, we're in the two mo banner years of financing ever in the history of teachers' college. The last two years, including this one, uh, have been, we had the highest enrollments at the highest rates of, of income. Uh, and at, at the same time, we had no raise because we were, we were afraid of the recession. So, but then all of a sudden, you know, so all right, so where do we go from here? I keep laughing. I said, it's a very, awesome. did I do that? No. One light one. Oh, uh, yeah, but what, wait, he's, uh, he's, he's switching. He, Go ahead. You're going? Okay. Well, the, the, I uh, mean, I think the real problem is that uh, uh, at the tertiary education level, we have to come to grips with, with cause and what's happening. I mean, the, well, everything has changed. I, I remember a discussion, Chuck Wagley, who, you, who was a professor at, at, of anthropology, when I was uh, uh, an instructor or my first rank, and I remember the discussion, we were sitting, in, uh, good anthropologists having a beer or something worse, and, uh, and he said, you know, there's going to be a time when, when anthropology, when professors, are, full professors, will make $25,000 a year. Now, he didn't quite make it, but, you know, oh, I'm saying, all right, so anthropologists, or professors are now making more than $25,000 a year, but, but nothing near what CEOs, but all of a sudden, everything else has changed presidents of the college or presidents of the university. Are, and we're not talking, not six figures, but seven figures. And, every, and then, of course, there's been this tremendous expansion of professional and other kind of staff. And all of it comes down to the student, ultimately. I mean, I tell a story and that people sort of blink at me. Well, tuition now is, what, a thousand something per point. I went to Columbia College, which was the most expensive, as or with all the expensive colleges. It was an Ivy League school in 1940, whatever it was. The tuition then was $200 a semester for all the points you could eat practically. And in those days, the Navy was around, so you took 20 points a semester. For, and it, so it cost, a total for four years was $1,600, which is a point and a half of what it costs for now. And you have to take 125, whatever it is, points. It is ridiculous. And the inflation comes nowhere near whatever the inflation was to this thing. And it's a desperate, you know, it's a desperate issue. And then how do, you, how do you deal with it? All right, so you fully fund. So that means people who uh, don't, don't come out of Princeton undergraduates uh, can't get into a graduate program because the competition is so straight. And they're the least, the Princeton graduates are the least that need the fully funding. And all the rest of the issues that go into that. Anyway, I see the financing of this thing as being a critically important thing. Uh, some way of, uh, of having quality overcome everything else in terms of uh, you know, uh, funding. And, and so this gets us into questions of the affirmative action and all the rest of it, which, which I'm a firm believer in, but I still believe that, that somehow we've got to, 
we've got to make sure that we're not uh, uh, discriminating and we're not running quota systems and uh, things of this sort. The other thing is that we've got to, uh, what has to be reviewed given, I mean, the United States, the industrial world has changed with the atom bomb, literally, has changed so remarkably, everything has changed, that the appropriateness of some of the training I mean, why in, God, why in God's name do you train some idiot to go look at fishing villages in the Caribbean? I mean, look, questions of the relevance of subject matter. Uh, how do you change it? How do you keep track of it? And how do you make that effective in terms of job placement? And, all the rest of it. and should we be concerned with that? Are, now, are you talking about the anthropological I'm talking curriculum? about the whole thing. Oh. Well, I'm talking well, not just curriculum. I'm just talking about, uh, I mean, anthropology in, 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 is interesting. In many ways, it's going out of business. It's become so, uh, what has happened is that specialization in anthropology for, well, if I can, if you give me two seconds on the history of this thing. In the old days, in the great golden old days, we all went to some exotic so-called you know, so place and studied uh, five people living in some, some place. Uh, supposedly never saw uh, anything else, no government officials, never saw a white man or a white girl or any of this nonsense. Uh, and. Uh, of course, and there were some reasons why this kind of thing was done, and nothing wrong with that. But certainly by the 1950s, 1960s, uh, funding uh, interest had shifted so that uh, we began to come home in terms of resource, not only here, but in England, in France, and all the rest of it. Uh, the tr some traditions were kept on, but we went out. And then we began to feed into kinds of speci specific problems. In the early days, we studied the entire culture, whatever that was, or the entire society, no matter how limited or big it was, and then wrote an ethnography or something of that sort. This is the way these characters live and do that. Uh, valuable, interesting. No, we're not told that. They say, uh, you know, uh, if you want to do some anthropology, tell us why this uh, works or doesn't work or, or something thematic. Uh, and what, so you begin to get more and more specialization. You get the character that knows something about drugs in society, something that knows X, Y, and Z. Uh, they have their own little associations. If you look at the list of associations in anthropology, you look at the, the bulletin of the American Anthropological Association, it's probably 40, 50, 100. The Society for you know, One-Legged Anthropologists Who Study Latin America, you know, all the combinations of it. But, but this, is not, this is no longer a joke. It, it means that anthropology, like many other fields, is no longer a unified thing, which probably, or it's changed to the point that we better take a look at what we're doing in terms of training them and popularizing it. There may be very little need, it may be much more need to, to, uh, to train something else, nuclear engineers or something, or at least to shift the balance a little bit in terms of that. And anthropology, of course, is always gonna suffer on this because it's at best a marginal um, a tertiary education field, I think it's very important, but it's, uh, but it's marginal in terms of how it's conceived and, and looked at. Well, you know, I did I want to at least, uh, you know, at some point get you to say, uh, you've said it in other ways, but to really just say very, very concisely uh, why you think uh, the study of anthropology at teacher's college is important and why you think it's going to continue to be important in the future? Oh, I think it's vitally important. Whether we do it properly or not at this point is another kind of a question. Uh, it is, in a funny way, it is the most synthetic of the social sciences. It is the, in that sense, and in the newest of the social sciences, if you want to think of generational things. I mean, literally it only goes back to 1870s, 1880s as a so-called scientific field. But it's a, it's a synthetic in that, it, that it, uh, it borrows and takes from all other fields and continues to do that from a methodological, from a technical point of view and puts it together in its own way. That, that was a good thing about it. But it's, it's, it's the broadest and the most uh, revealing to people who are going to go into relatively, uh, I shouldn't call it narrow fields, but more rigid fields. And, and uh, it, it was very nice, t I only taught for a year or two in those days in the college, the undergraduate thing. These were very bright kids who couldn't care less about anthropology in the, or in terms of uh, their uh, 
their training and getting into med school and going to law school, this sort of thing. But uh, you get the occasional one who really saw this as such a broadening experience that impacted the way he was going to look and work in his own, whatever the, his own field was. And we've get, we get this all the time. It's very funny to see that, that occur. And I think it's vitally important for education people uh, who in, certainly in the past come with very little liberal art kind of broadening kind of thing. Uh, so it's, it's, it may sound you know, idiotic to a professor of um, you know, curriculum to say, to tell a student to take a course on, on funny people who wear you know, grass skirts or whatever it is. We don't quite teach anthropology that way. But, but, uh, but even, that, I mean, the, the relevance of that, at least I see as being very important. And uh, uh, I, look, I was looking back at some old papers, in fact, last night, and uh, the kind of series of letters that I got and I kept some, and they're, they're always to that thing, you know, what an, what an interesting experience this kind of thing was. Not that you're a good teacher, not that that's not the case, but the material is really interesting because it did a, an, an awful lot for me. And the thing that struck me as being extremely funny is I got, I had a number of this who are now, uh, people writing 20 years later, who are lawyers. And lawyers, I think, you know, find, you know, who are <laughs> tied into, you know, a particular system, so, so I don't know if this makes sense, but I do think of it as an, as, uh, from that point, a very important field. Now. Well, I, may I just say yeah. that uh, coming from the dis a love of the discipline also, it seems to me it's especially important for people who are going to be educators. Oh, yeah. And so. Well, on top of everything else, I mean, on a very, very uh, practical matter, the kind of people that I researched uh, who were, you know, hundreds if not thousands of miles away in very different settings, are the, are the, their kids are the ones in these schools right now in New York City. I mean, I learned more. Uh, let me give you a, an example of how this works. I live on 92nd Street and uh, well, a block away from Madison Avenue. On Madison Avenue, there is a 7-Eleven or whatever they call. They have a little thing, they sell flowers outside, you know. And there are two people there who I, they're both gone now, but for a, c a couple of years. One was a Bolivian, and another, the other one was a Barbadian. The Bolivian came from a community that I worked in, and the Barbadian was from a community that I worked in. Each one, one in Spanish and the other one in English, kept telling me what's happening in these places and telling me about their kids in the school two blocks down the road. You know, so, so, you, so I mean, much of our work, and that's, or much of my work now lately, uh, and uh, the work of uh, my colleagues has been on so-called migrant kids in the United States. We've done sort of phenomenal work on Dominicans in New York, and we pioneered the study of sort of uh, social fields of uh, that we work in communities in the Dominican Republic that have sent people and that are, and that are receiving people coming back. And you know, we see this whole thing as a, as, as, as a field, as a social field. But I'm just saying is that uh, educators, we're, not, we're no longer talking about exotic animals. We're talking about you know, the, the, the kind of kids they're going to look at and see in their classroom who will be exhibiting some of the cultural patterns of their parents and so on. And so, and in fact, a lot of the teachers <laughs> are from this place. It's really very funny to, to uh, I teach a course in the Caribbean, so I always got a few Caribbean types. In the old days, they were mostly teachers. They'd come in, they were very middle class, and they would be absolutely, absolutely appalled at, at the, the kinds of things that I would talk about, that, that these are poor people, they're living in, you know, I wasn't quite saying in squalor, I wasn't saying, but no, no, we are, we don't, we don't come from that kind of thing, this is ridiculous. Then there was the period of black power, and they all kept calling me a middle class clunk because I wasn't telling, <laughs> telling it, I was saying the same thing all the time. For, but anyway, you get the, the point, mm -hmm. that, that much of this is situational. But, but the, the truth of the matter is, in New York City, the United States, is now you know, much more of a hyphenated kind of co community. Than, yeah. Would you say that again, New York City? Uh, much more of a hyphenated. Uh, say from the beginning, New York City. New York City is much more of a hyphenated, multi-layered, ethnic, ethnically, diverse community where s knowledge of 
variation, cultural, social variation, uh, no matter of what kind, is critical to, uh, to somebody in education, particularly somebody on the front lines, that is the teacher. And do you think that this institution values uh, that point of view? That you, uh, do I think that teachers college values it? No, not particularly. I mean, I think if, you t if you're talking, you know, give lip service to this, but I don't think so. I think, you know, just like any other professor, I will tell you, my, pro my you know, s pedagogical skills of this kind, you know, overwhelm many of this other stuff. You should be able to do X, Y, and Z, and maybe perhaps they're right. But wouldn't it be nice to have a combination, or at least have this kind of an influence? I do see anthropology, the role of anthropology, in, and other disciplines at Teachers College as a service one. That is, to inform, to illuminate, uh, to, you know, not to instruct actual behavior to, uh, of teachers or educators, but to make them aware that there are things out there that might complicate their lives if they don't take them into consideration. And that seems to me to be very much the legacy of Teachers College from the beginning, you know, from Russell and oh, yeah. Dewey, you know, that to prepare people for uh, the responsibility of being yeah. citizens in a democracy and, uh, I mean. <laughs> well, I was, it's interesting, uh, uh, my opening lecture, which I didn't quite do this year, to an to a introductory group, which would be uh, not just anthropology students, but others, is the difference between a discipline and something called education, that, uh, yeah, there's a possibility, but it doesn't really exist now, of an educational discipline. Uh, this is going back to, uh, you know, uh, to Durkheim, practically, and this, this sort of thing. But uh, that uh, what, what education really is, really a domain, of a convoluted domain of activities, values, uh, schedules, uh, and when you think of education in the United States, is this absolute, I mean, and the role of the discipline is using its own unique toolkit is to explore these issues these pro and, and help or try to help resolve some of the problems where it's appropriate. And, I, and, and, and then the ancillary thing is to make aware educators who are in this domain that these things exist out there and you better you know, try to take them into consideration. You see it, we see, uh, and, and right now is a very interesting time for it. If you start thinking of, of, the, of the amount of political energy that's going on now around, around education, around, especially around election times. You know. and, and the role of, well, for example, it becomes very important to uh, teachers college what happens to Charlie Wrangell at the moment, I would think. I shall say, say no more. <laughs> what, why is that? No, he was the big man in Harlem and we are, we are not expanding. We are involved with setting up uh, a school and schooling and, and help, trying to help. And Wrangell has been, apparently, from what I gather, very useful in this, or at least has opened the doors to it. What happens if uh, he is made into a bum or whatever it is, or gets, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to defend Wrangell. I'm just saying is that, uh, that, that Teachers College has its relationships into the, in the community. Which it, has to, which it has to maintain and keep hold. And, uh, and I think this is happening now more and more. Furman, I think, uh, has been, you know, in this, in this regard, uh, has, has turned to the community much more than any of, it, of uh, her predecessors. She's yes. brought in people who do this kind of thing. Uh, so. We've covered a lot of territory. Um. <laughs> you still have energy, <laughs> but so um, uh, that this is about the celebration of Teachers College 125th anniversary that's coming Say up. Say something good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just uh, in conclusion, is there anything you'd like to say? Well, how can I put it personally? I always wondered what my life would have been, professional life, if I were not at Teachers College. And did I make a mistake? I mean, that's a usual kind of thing. In retrospect, I don't think so. I think I got the most of it. <laughs> I mean, I got the best of it. And I think, you know, uh, I think in most respects, Teachers College has been a nurturing thing for 
the individual for the individual faculty member, and I think uh, on the whole for the community itself, that is. Uh, it suffers uh, with some of the global stereotypes about schools of education looked upon by their brethren across the street or any other place that somehow these are second class operations. And uh, I'm not, I don't think I ever came in with that, sir, but uh, it is such a false mythology, it's, uh, it really is. Uh, these are productive places and can be made much, and can be made more productive just as any other part of, of, of tertiary education. But uh, uh, it's interesting the use you can make, uh, well, it's, this kind of a professional school is different from a law school, from a medical school, uh, where, the, where the curriculum is in either of these other places is, I won't say more rigid, much more sharply defined lockstep. You've got to learn this, and you've got to take some you know, exit exam, or you know, you have to go to a board, you have to get certified. So education is not that; it's much broader, and uh, it's it's very important. But there is a statement I can make: where we've been useful, and perhaps more useful than many other places, is really the training of foreign students. It's not that we have I don't remember what the percentage is: twelve, fourteen percent, something kind of. A, okay. They come from all over. They, it, uh, over time, they vary from regions. So when I first came here, they were basically uh, South American, Caribbean, maybe Latin American. Now we're overwhelmed by Asian, you know, Chinese, Japanese, and so on. And it makes a difference. Uh, but I remember uh, my friend M.J. Smith, who I mentioned very early, visited here once, and he said, what do you do with your foreign students? He was very, and now he himself is a Jamaican of color. And I said, I said, oh no, we treat them like everybody else does. Nonsense, you have to, you have to be harder. I said, what do you mean harder? He said, no, you really have to demand that they know their material. I said, why so? I said, you know, they come out, you know, it's on their, they have to be on their own to go out and become an anthropologist. I said, anthropologist, nonsense. He said, You're, the Americans go out, yeah, and become anthropologists. And uh, that's what they are. Well, the, the Jamaican that comes here, or the Beijing, or the Peruvian, yeah, he may go back as an anthropologist, but he becomes the prime minister. And there, it's dangerous. <laughs> and he's quite right. I mean, so in fact, it, the interesting thing about this in terms of uh, reputation, one of the things I worried about when I did come is I had been at Columbia's Big Dot University, and it was, and I was, you travel around the world and you say, oh, Columbia, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, what is it going to be like teacher scholars? I turned out the teacher scholars was, had a better reputation outside because every damn minister of education in the world at that time was practically, you know, was, was that a teacher's college or their father was or somebody was, or somebody was. And it was really very funny from that, from that point of view. That, and that's still going on. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. All right, well, if you have uh, nothing else you'd like to add, unless there is well, something you'd like to I add. I haven't said anything that could be added, too, because... <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, I hope it wasn't completely gibberish, because... Uh, no, I think uh, I found it very interesting. So I'll just say thank you very much. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome. It's a noble thing you're doing. <laughs> and you. <laughs> you have so to sit here and listen. We're <laughs> going to sit here for a second to get room tone, just quietly, to get the sound of the room.